This paid podcast is produced by Slate Studios and Century 21 Real Estate. All uses of trademarks or brands are not meant to convey sponsorship or affiliation of this podcast. From Slate Studios and Century 21 Real Estate, this is The Relentless, a podcast about looking at sales differently. What if? What if I thought outside the box? What if it was more of a celebration with our clients than work? In every episode, we're pulling back the curtain with thought leaders across industries and talking about how they embrace change, overcome hurdles, and stay relentless. I'm Dr. Julie Gerner. I've spent over a decade studying the behaviors of the ultra-successful and have used those insights to empower business leaders in finance, technology, and real estate. Staying on top of industry trends can feel like its own full-time job. You can read newsletters, listen to podcasts, talk shop at conferences, but it can still feel like you're behind the curve. Every industry evolves, and with today's technology, those changes are happening faster than ever. So how do you anticipate that change and spot trends before they become standard practice? And that's what we'll dive into with today's guest. We're talking with someone who not only knows the ins and outs of the economic landscape, but also distills and interprets financial trends for his audience. Combining different aspects of what was happening in the tech world, in the financial markets, in the real estate world, all these different elements of how the economy works, and turning that into one coherent story. Learning how to do that early in my career has really been a skill that I've been trying to cultivate ever since. Neil Irwin is a best-selling author and the senior economic correspondent at The New York Times. And after several years covering the economy, he made a realization. It occurred to me that the stuff I was writing about in my day job in economic trends and these forces people are wrestling with as they navigate their own careers are two sides of the same coin. This correlation inspired his book, How to Win in a Winner-Take-All World, The Definitive Guide to Adapting and Succeeding in High-Performance Careers. And what he found was that these economic and technological shifts were affecting professionals across a variety of fields. As I would talk to friends, to business school classmates, to sources, we'd talk about what's changing in your industry, and I'd hear the same sorts of things. You know, it was remarkable how much people in banking or retail or healthcare or law were dealing with the same kind of shifts in technology and business models in what it means to have a job that I was dealing with. So when was the first moment that you realized that your industry and kind of print journalism was dramatically changing and required that kind of expansion? You know, it's funny. So I started in the newspaper business in the year 2000. So it seems like a different era. You know, when I showed up as a summer intern at the Washington Post, there were all these people around who had been doing the exact same job for 10 or 20 or 30 years. Uh, Career paths were very linear. People knew what it meant to to advance, you know, what a promotion looked like. And, And what was already starting to happen then, but we didn't see it yet, was really the ground shifting beneath our feet with the entire economic model of the media business. And um, by the time we entered uh, the more the kind of crisis era, 2007, 8, 9, it wasn't just that the economy was in free fall. It was also that our business model was in free fall. And it was becoming clear that the web, digital media, was not just the future, but increasingly the present. And, you know, it's funny seeing, you know, people I worked with 20 years ago who has had uh, kind of long, vibrant careers and who has had to retire prematurely or take a buyout or move move on to something different. You know, there are common threads in those people who have had those thriving, successful careers. And it's the people who were able to drive that change, embrace that change, as opposed to be, uh, you know, be victims of it. One of the things that a lot of people struggle with is how do you stay on top of trends so that you can be successful in the industry that's shifting beneath you? Yeah, it used to be only CEOs, people in the executive suite had to worry too much about the competitive landscape, technological changes. Now that's everybody's job. You know, you can't just sit around and be a victim of of whatever change happens in your industry. You want to see around the corner, see what direction things are going, drive that change, be the initiator of it, and at a minimum kind of understand where things are going and how you can position yourself to to do well in that evolving world. What tips or advice would you give to people across different industries like salespeople, entrepreneurs, those in real estate? You know, how can they pinpoint trends or begin to examine trends more effectively in their own field? 
So you can start with just the general purpose media, general mass media, especially business media. If you read the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Financial Times, Bloomberg, you know, you follow what those publications are writing about your industry. You're learning a lot. Same with any kind of trade publications that follow your specific industry. Um, that's that's a first step. I, you know, I think it's amazing how much good information is out there from kind of thought leaders, executives, consultants, people who are who are really engaged at the high levels of different industries through social media channels, through Twitter, through LinkedIn. Um, you know, if you find the people who are really influential, know what's going on in your business, follow them through these different channels, you can learn a lot. You know, if you are able to obtain uh, analyst reports, consultant reports, sometimes those can be hard to get if you're not, you know, spending a lot of money. But if you have access to those, some of them get published online, uh, you know, you can really see around the corner, see what's happening. So what I'm hearing from you is really there has to be a lack of complacency that you have to re kind of really go out there and seek it. Yeah, I think it's hard to do it if you view it as drudgery. What I'm describing, it is a lot of work. You know, it is a job on top of your day job. It's keeping track of an entire uh, industry, an entire kind of competitive landscape. And it's a lot easier if you kind of embrace that and have fun with that. And uh, I think it's harder if you're kind of checking boxes and just doing things in a dutiful way. But what I find is if you start digging into a subject, understanding it better, it can be fun. And I think if you start doing it and really follow the the industry trends, the, the players, what's happening with different executives, and you start to embrace it and, and understand what's going on, I think it can be a really enjoyable part of your job. So do you find that a good source of identifying trends is really the people on the ground in any given industry that sometimes perhaps they're aware of shifts in your industry before they're presented in articles or journals or anything like that? Or do you feel like that is such a microcosm, that it's such a small group that maybe uh, paying more attention to outside information is more valuable? This is a really complicated question that I, I wrestle with a lot in my own role as a, as a journalist. You know, how do you value the, the anecdote, the, the one kind of interesting thing you hear on the ground from somebody who really is closer to an issue? Uh, how do you weigh that against what the data says? And the data we know, it can be slow, it can fail to kind of account for important shifts if it's, you know, you're seeing overall averages. And, you know, I think the key is if you're looking at individual anecdote, individual's experiences, you know, suppose you're running a sales operation, you know, you don't want to read too much into what one salesperson is telling you because they might just be having a bad week or a good week. Uh, you could get misleading information. So I think there's a, a constant back and forth of taking what individuals and anecdotal material tell you and kind of testing it against data and then zooming back the other direction. You know, the data is saying this, does that actually line up with what you're seeing from multiple anecdotes? I, I think it's not an either or. I think it's taking one set of information back and forth against the other and kind of finding a dialectic where you get to some answer that actually is, is closer to the truth than either one would be alone. Well, that's interesting. So, you know, in some sense, if you're trying to spot trends or trying to uh, look at what's coming in the industry, maybe, you know, while you're reading these trade publications, keeping some of that information in your head and does it jive with maybe some of the agents on the ground and the things that they're telling you and you can start kind of piecing this together on your own. Yeah. And I'll add, you know, there can be trends in an industry that are actually bad directions, right? You know, sometimes an entire industry will be following down one path and that'll be the kind of consensus view of where to go, but it'll turn out to be a, a dead end or a, or a cul-de-sac or a bad idea. Uh, in the media business, we've seen a lot of this, right? So for five minutes, everybody's trying to, to do Facebook videos, but it turns out consumers don't really like Facebook videos. They weren't very good. So then every publication pivots back away from that. So uh, th this is a delicate thing. You know, I'm, I'm encouraging everybody to really study what direction their industry is going to drive that change. But you have to keep an open mind, keep your ear to the ground, look for evidence of ways in which that consensus can be misplaced or misguided. Was there ever a time that you felt like you had a bit of a misstep that, you know, you thought you saw a trend coming, but it turns out that the information was pointing in a different direction? Plenty of them. You know, I think there's there's plenty of times that, you know, you think you're identifying something and, and you think you're on the cutting edge of some insight, but you can be either too early, you can be just completely wrong. Uh, you know, I, as an example, so in the mid-2000s, 2007, 2008, I was writing about the, the kind of building global financial crisis. But at the same time, I was also writing about inflation pressures and, and how oil prices were really spiking during that era. And the idea that inflation and oil prices were a huge problem in the middle of 2008, it sure looked that way. But if you made that the main emphasis, you missed that there was this giant financial crisis right on the verge of you know, collapsing the entire economy. And so sometimes you, you see things that seem important and, and it can actually be a, a misleading you know, misdirection. 
So how do you know if something that you're following is going to be a long-term trend and something that's relevant versus something that will quickly fade away in the industry? Well, I think you have to ask yourself some hard questions about the fundamental economics driving it, right? Is this a fad or is this something that's really resonating with customers, not just with kind of speculative what direction the world might go? So on that example I used a minute ago of, you know, how the entire media industry embraced Facebook video for a few years and, and then it didn't really work out, you know, that was always driven by kind of more aspirational things that Facebook wanted to do rather than actual consumer demand. And if you looked at the actual kind of viewership of those stories and those videos, it wasn't actually that great. You know, I think asking yourself the question of what does the customer want? Am I doing something? Am I creating something that gives that customer what they want, as opposed to gaming the system and gaming what the CEO says they think they want. I think that's how you know whether you're on a path that can be sustainable, be durable, and really part of a, a healthy career. So knowing about trends is one thing, but using that knowledge to see opportunity and to take advantage of that opportunity seems like a completely other animal. So how do you suggest that self-starters with their own business or within a company really take advantage of the knowledge once they have it? Well, you know, there's different things. Depends on the exact uh, the details. You know, sometimes if you see that there's a need for a certain set of skills in your industry, going to take a class at night or joining a team and uh, learning from that team on developing those skills can be really valuable. Uh, you know, a big idea and theme I deal with in the book a, a lot is this idea of stretching your, yourself across disciplines. And I call it being a glue person, somebody who can work on a team with people with lots of different technical skills. And you might not have all those technical skills yourself, and that's fine, but you have to understand where they're coming from and be agile at, at speaking their language and helping these people with different skills communicate with each other and convey to each other what they need to do to, to make a successful product. But stretching across disciplines doesn't come naturally to everyone. So what advice would you give to that person who's taking the first step in mid-career when they've been doing something in a very similar way for a very long time? You know, I think the more you do it, the easier it becomes. Adaptability is a skill in and of itself. If you do it a lot in your 20s, it becomes easier to do it again in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. So mid-career... There, I think the, the question is, you know, if you're somebody who comes from a sales background and you need to enhance your kind of technological skills, you know, can you embed with a team? Can you ask somebody on the engineering side of your organization to show you how they work and how they create what they create? I think there's a lot of room to, to stretch in ways that can be compatible with a kind of mid-career situation. It's not as easy when, you're, when, you, when you get a little older as I'm experiencing myself now, but it's, uh, I think, a really important thing to cultivate. All right. So I want to just step back for a second and just talk about trends again before we jump into cultivating that adaptability. How do you find that larger trends influence smaller markets? Yeah, this is a tough problem because, you know, there's all kinds of data that we get that's national that can mask a lot of variance in different areas, whether it's different localities, different industries. And I think making sure, you know, you understand what your customer needs is more important than, you know, what some national survey says. So again, to use the metaphor of my own industry, the media business, if you're working at a small local paper, you know, understanding what the New York Times' strategy is and what kinds of articles the New York Times writes is probably not the most useful thing for you to be doing. Uh, you, you have a different audience, you have a different purpose, you have a different business model. Uh, at the same time, understanding what the Times is doing as a backdrop for, for what you're doing is very important. So understanding what's, what the national backdrop is, uh, but then being open-minded about what might be different about your specific market that you're in. After a quick break, we'll talk about how, when it comes to success, it's not enough to spot trends. You'll need to adapt to them as well. Hey listeners, mentorship is an invaluable tool to evolve professionally and get ahead in your career faster. But it's also an investment. It takes time to develop and have it pay off. We want your questions. What specific questions do you have around finding a mentor and growing a strong relationship that will inspire greatness? We'd really like to hear from you. So send us a message. Our email address is century21pod at slate.com or tweet your question with the hashtag century21pod. And we may use your question in an upcoming episode. We're back with Neil Irwin. He's the author of How to Win in a Winner-Take-All World. So, Neil, we talked about spotting industry trends, but what have you discovered about how people adapt to those trends? So I think it is a skill, as I said, that that you can cultivate. Uh, you know, I've seen a lot of examples of how people do that. So in the book, I went to a lot of different big companies. I asked them two basic questions. I said, 
what does it take to thrive in, in, in this company today? I went to you know, Microsoft and Goldman Sachs and Walmart and a lot of big name brand companies, also a lot of smaller ones, and said, okay, what does it take to thrive in this organization? Can I talk to some of the people who do that? And so I built the book around case studies of people who've done that, who've navigated this really fast changing economic environment and have thrived within it. And I think a common thread I, I saw is that there's not some one path people chart out ahead of time. So, you know, this is not a world where you can say, you know, I'm going to do this job for three years and then that job for two years, and then I'll cut across to that, then I'll get a promotion to vice president. You know, it's great to have ambitions and to, you know, set your eyes on the on the prize and the, the brass ring. But the idea that you can sit out when you're young and plot out what it's going to look like is not the way it works. The way it does work is as you move along, you might not know exactly where you're going, but you know that you're always gaining different types of experiences so that you're positioning yourself no matter what direction the business evolves, that what other opportunities might arise, that you're well positioned to seize them, drive them, take advantage of them. And that's what differentiated the people who have really thrived in this fast changing world versus those who have struggled. So considering that the way we do everything, including business, is changing because of things like digital technology, how can we use that technology to our advantage? Yeah, I think this is an important idea. We hear all the worries about AI and machine learning and robotics, all these things that are going to leave us all without jobs. I'm not as pessimistic as, as a lot of people are on, on that stuff. I think we've seen the history of technological change is that you know, new innovations enable greater productivity and enable higher incomes. And ultimately, workers, human workers, end up doing slightly different things as time passes, and that doesn't uh, leave us worse off. But that those details aside, it does imply that certain types of jobs are likely to go away. Certain things that are very repetitive, that are very kind of process oriented, those jobs really are at risk because I think computers are getting better and better at doing those types of jobs every every month and every year that passes. Um, so I think asking yourself the question, am I just executing some process or am I really delivering value and insight to this business and pushing it ahead is an important question to ask. And if you are in that kind of more process oriented uh, role, figuring out how to stretch yourself and, and push yourself into the area where you are applying human judgment to making decisions, that's a, that's a really valuable way to try and evolve your career. So could you give me some examples of the repetitive jobs that you think are, are more likely to be affected versus others? Well, let me give you an example from the legal business. So there are certain lawyers out there who their entire work is to review contracts and look for things that are out of place or poorly phrased or ambiguous and try and fix those. That's the kind of job that could be at risk. I think computers are going to get better and better at doing contract review. Similarly in, in medicine. So there are you know, radiologists who are looking at scans every day, looking for evidence of broken bones or tumors or whatever they're looking for. You know, I think uh, that's the kind of stuff that can get more and more automated. At the same time, there are in both law and healthcare, there are things that will never be automated. You know, a trial lawyer is not something you want a robot doing. Uh, if I'm ever on trial for some serious crime, I definitely want a really good human trial lawyer. In healthcare, uh, you know, being a doctor who can work with patients, who can listen to them, who can, you know, show empathy, who can have those kind of human characteristics is really, really important. I don't think we just want a computer to tell us what disease we have and and how to, how to deal with it. And I think that implies in more traditional business settings as well, right? If you're involved in sales and really all you're doing is kind of filling out forms and, and passing them up the chain, you're not adding much value. But if you're the type of salesperson who's really helping the customer decide what they need, guiding them toward a decision, really showing human empathy and, and, and helping them make the right decision, then you do have a greater future than, than the other type. So what I'm really hearing is that not only do you want to be up to date on the latest technology, but you really need to be leaning into professional skills that foster human connection. But I think the flip side of that is, you know, even as you show those human characteristics and are, and are adding kind of unique value, you need to take advantage of new technology that arises, right? What you want is to not just be the old kind of salesman who's good at, you know, backslapping and making people feel comfortable. You also want to understand what the latest analytics are showing, and you need to understand what the data is telling you about how to find customers, how to, you know, what might be uniquely valuable for them. So there are ways in which even applying kind of more traditional values and what it means to have a good job and combining that with the modern analytics is a really valuable skill. When you say you should combine skills rather than focus on a single aptitude, can you speak more about that? Yeah. So um, it's funny, you know, in the old days, I was a writer. I would write my you know, sit at the computer, write my article, it would go to an editor and then a copy editor and then the production department and would be in this linear assembly line. If you look at how, you know, modern media organizations work, digital media organizations, and also a lot of other industries too, but what you see is not people with one skill 
feeding their work into an assembly line, you'll see a conference room with six or eight or 10 people in it who all have very different skills working together. So in my field, might be a couple of traditional print journalists like myself, might be a couple of uh, visual artists, might include video people, audio people, can include software developers, analytics people, product people. Um, these are all people with different technical skills who don't just work in different spots on the assembly line, but actually have to collaborate and come together to make a, a great app or a great podcast. You know, it's, it's not a simple thing of uh, you do your work, hand it off to somebody else. It's understanding how they work, what they do, and how those things fit together. This gets back to this glue person idea. A glue person is the person who can be in that meeting, be in that conference room, and help make the, the output greater than the sum of its parts by understanding what different people bring to the table, how they communicate, what they do. And if you can cultivate that ability, you're in really good shape. So how exactly would an entrepreneur begin going about thinking how they might diversify their skill set? So I think it's understanding where they might be weak and kind of leaning into that and developing those skills. Maybe it's you come from sales, you want to understand the kind of high-level marketing strategy or management. How do you manage a team of people? These are all things where, you know, there are classes you can take, there are teams you might embed on, even just, you know, listening to podcasts, listening to interviews with people who do those things well and understanding it can be really valuable. I think the key is identify those things, you know, be deliberate about it, be thoughtful about it. And you don't want it to happen by accident. You don't want it to happen just out of dumb luck. You want it to happen because you realize you need that expanded horizon and you're out there to try and get it. I love your notion of being really strategic about it. Uh, do you have any real life examples where having diversified experience really made the difference? So I have a case study in the book about a guy named Dan Eckert, who's an executive at, at Walmart now. And he was kind of evolving his career in this really roundabout way. It was a little random. He was in the Marines, then he was you know, in a consulting firm, and then a startup that ultimately failed. And he was struggling, but then he uh, ended up in, a, in the banking industry and you know, realized that, that all the work he'd been doing did give him some exposure to lots of different areas. And he became a, a really high-powered and, and successful executive at this intersection of, of how banking and finance, technology, security, legal affairs and kind of product development all fit together. And he eventually got hired by Walmart to build what's uh, now their payments app that's a really important part of their strategy for, you know, one of the biggest companies on earth. So, you know, I think that's an example of driving a career where you're getting those multiple types of exposure so that even if you're not deep in any one of them, even if, you know, Dan's not a, not a lawyer, but he knows how to deal with the lawyers who deal with their compliance things. He's not a technologist. He doesn't program, but he can work with the programmers who create these products and are in the, in the weeds of the code. That's, uh, you know, that's an example of, of how being deliberate, being strategic about, about getting those broad experiences can really pay off. It seems like being strategic about the experiences is something that is immediately valuable, but you don't always know where it's going to, to lead. That's right. Dan's an example of that, too. I think being strategic and deliberate is not the same as saying you know exactly what each step is going to look like. You know, the modern careers are this combination of you want to be strategic and thoughtful, but also be open to opportunity and follow opportunities as they arise. And those might sound contradictory. I really believe they are not. I really believe this is a thing where you can simultaneously look ahead and see what types of skills you need to develop, cultivate that adaptability, you know, make sure you're broadening your horizons while not having a very precise vision of what exact jobs that will lead to. And, you know, I think being hungry for different types of experience without being hungry for some specific career path and specific sequence of jobs is the way to think of it. And I think that's a, an idea that, that really paid off in many of the people I, I did case studies of in the book. So what can we learn from following trends across different industries, industries that are not necessarily the ones that we're involved in specifically? Yeah, I think there's a lot to learn from from other industries, and I think I found that myself. You know, I've I, again, I've worked in the media business, but as I talk to people in banking and finance, in retail, in consumer products, in technology and software, you know, you see some common threads, and you can see some things that play out in one area that might eventually play out in others. You know, I think if you look at how things are working in a big retail company or a big bank or, or a big media company today, a lot of it will resemble what was happening at you know, at Google 15 years ago in terms of how teams come together and do kind of uh, agile, uh, you know, creation of products. So I think there's definitely ways to look across industries that are not your own and see common threads and and see dir the direction things are going. That's true even within an industry, right? So if you're trying to figure out what skills you need to acquire, think about in your own industry, what are the most innovative firms? What are the most forward-thinking firms? 
and then go to their job board, right? Go to the job listings of that firm and see what they're hiring for, what they need. Not because you necessarily want to go work there, but because if the most innovative company in your industry is hiring for X skill, you know, maybe it's time for you to start developing X skill to look a little bit down the road. I can really see the value in that. That's a, that's a great hack that anyone can do. It's a way to zero in on a skill necessary to grow. And to your point, one of the things I'm finding when I'm talking to so many people in the real estate industry is that those who are getting ahead are often developing skills that many would see as outside of real estate entirely. Things like gaining a fluency with social media platforms to reach their target market better, or integrating things like virtual staging to make listings stand out to potential buyers. It sounds minor, but these small tweaks help to make them more desirable in their field. So, Neil, we actually have a listener question from a Century 21 affiliate. It's about an industry trend that puzzles them. Here it is, voiced by one of our producers. Why don't brokers become more involved with the 50% of the population that rents? It's a massive amount of future business. The renters are being turned away from realtors and, of course, at the same time being conditioned to use the Internet. When it comes time to buy, they're used to finding homes without an agent. I saw this coming back in the 90s and I've been doing rentals successfully for 34 years. I still to this day find it amazing how brokers do not nurture this business gold mine. So I'm not an expert in the residential real estate business. There are people way more qualified than me to answer that specific question. I think that the, there is a broader implication of the question, and that's you know thinking long-term about whatever business you're building and not just looking at the transactions immediately around the corner, but what's available if you really invest in a relationship over the over the medium term. And I think that applies in a lot of different fields. And I think the ability to you know, not be narrowly constrained by what is going to get me a, a commission or get me a paycheck tomorrow, but think about what is going to make me better off and make me a more valuable provider for my client and ultimately my company. Uh, you know, it, it's funny. Sometimes this is a – the reason that's tough is because – Companies change so much, jobs change so much, it, it can sometimes be a bad idea to plan too far ahead and, and think too long term. But I think we're really leaving something on the table if we don't think that way and, and understand that it's not just about what we can do today and tomorrow, it's about what we can do two years from now, five years from now. You know, Neil, I think your insights are spot on. It's smart. It's just smart in your career to tap potential clients, no matter how far down the line they are, that you're a resource and you're kind of cultivating a relationship and playing the long game, but also, you know, building a network. And I think that that ultimately builds a more successful career down the line. One of the things that we ask everybody who is a guest on our podcast, how do you define relentless? We all have our own ambitions. We all have our own direction we want to go, things we want to do in our lives and our careers. I think it's about appreciating the arc that you're on and that it's not just about the next transaction. It's not just about the next job. It's about creating a situation where you can keep having rewarding experiences for decades to come. It's, you know, we're looking at a 40, 45 year career for most people. If you think too short term and you aren't really doing things that, that position yourself for long term success, uh, you're shooting yourself in the foot and really not leaving yourself in a good spot. To be relentless is to think in that long term way and make sure that you're going to have a long and successful career, not a flash in the pan. One of the things, uh, Neil, we wanted to try out in this podcast is we were going to have a little fun and to end the conversation, a lightning round of sorts. And so I'll list a big trend in an industry and you tell me whether it's going to be a passing one or here to stay. Are you open to it? Sure. Let's do it. Self-driving cars. Well, <laughs> that's a tough one because it's not here yet. Uh, I think it'll be here to stay when it arrives. I think it's further away than people think. I think we're talking 10, 15, 20 years. Bot doctors or kind of AI healthcare? I think that's uh, here to stay. I think that'll happen more and more. Blockchain technology. Passing. I, I don't see a role for blockchain that's other than kind of some really technical back office stuff that nobody really cares about. I think in terms of sweeping over all of our lives and systems, I don't think it's going to happen. Alternative transportation like scooters or e-bikes. I think that's here to stay. I'm, uh, I don't really use those myself, but they seem to really fit a lot of people's needs. Grain milks like oat milk, kind of non-dairy milk products. I'm going to say here to stay. I think the shift away from, from animal products, uh, given concerns over health and climate, I think, uh, I, th I think that's here to stay. Social media. Oh, man, that's a tough one. Here to stay. I don't think we ever stop uh, being social. What form it takes, I think, will change a lot. But uh, I think some form of social media is here to stay. All right. Well, I guess, folks, you heard it here first. Thanks so much for joining me today on The Relentless, Neil. Thanks for having me. The Relentless is produced by Slate Studios and Century 21 Real Estate. I'm Dr. Julie Gurner. 
Thanks so much for listening, and please join us next time. Copyright Century 21 Real Estate, LLC. All rights reserved. Century 21 Real Estate, LLC fully supports the principles of the Fair Housing Act and the Equal Opportunity Act. Each office is independently owned and operated. Nothing herein is intended to create an employment relationship. This material may contain suggestions and best practices that you may use at your discretion. The opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individuals featured and not necessarily of Century 21 Real Estate.